Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Capaldo from North Providence, Rhode Island, the Holy Spirit's job description. Welcome, thank you for listening. In this uh, message I'm going to talk a little bit about the traits of Ecclesia, Ecclesia being the, the, the body of believers, it can be the full body of believers in Jesus Christ, it can be a small group, Ecclesia, and all, all the groups fit together for one purpose, to bring glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we've been trying to develop this concept in our ministry of Ecclesia and uh, uh, we've come up with this expression church without walls meaning there should not be walls between yourselves and others and that uh, you don't necessarily have to go to a building and put uh, put a wall in between yourself and, and and other people so church without walls is kind of a I don't know it's kind of a a catchphrase I get you know I guess we'll try to give it some substance but I, I just like to uh, because I've been doing some study and some reading on uh, on Ecclesia and this this concept of uh, of Christian worship which began in the first century and which never has been contradicted in uh, by anything in scripture uh, and so I just wanted to go over some of the things that, I, that I've been reading and learning and studying and uh, and maybe give you some ideas of you know if you had an Ecclesia group you know what it would look like. I mean, what would, what, you know, what would people be doing uh, uh, if you had a, a small ecclesia, you know, as part of the big, you know, the full body of Christ. So, um, thank you again, Father, for this opportunity to bring forward a message, and we ask that it will be a blessing and uh, of great use to those who will hear it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Uh, one thing about uh, an ecclesia uh, group, I mean, uh, is that people got together in uh, in the first century, and uh, typically they worshipped in homes. Now, uh, you know, there might be a network of different homes that are not divided according to denomination. They're all one in Christ, but you can't stuff everybody into one home, so you might have kind of several homes where this type of meeting takes place, but they're all one in Christ. I mean, it's a, there, there's a unity of those groups. Uh, and then maybe once in a while they would meet in a bigger place, and you know there's some there's some scriptural basis for that. Is sometimes they they uh, they they met you know by a temple or you know <clears throat> near or in a big building, and there are some some places that uh, you can look in scripture and find that out. Is that uh, you know you can have the small group meeting, and then a number of small groups can get together and. Uh, you know, worship. Uh, you know, in some common uh, on some common themes, or in some common areas, or uh, you know, just all together praise and worship um, in bigger places. So that's kind of the concept: is that you don't really go for a church building because really you don't. If you are the church, then you don't really have to go to church. If you're born again and saved, and the Spirit is inside of you, you are the church. The church is the people. The church is not the building. The building is a place to go, and if you're in a home, you're in a building. But this idea of an official, professional church or religious organization with professional clergy who are up above the rest the rest of us, this is not really a biblical concept. And I think the first century believers, if they saw what happened, you know, for what's been happening for the last 17 centuries to the faith, I, th I think that this would not... Uh, uh, this would not find favor. They would not be pleased to see how much we have uh, departed from the uh, the original faith. But you can read about meetings in homes, you know, in Acts twenty twenty and in Romans sixteen three and five, First Corinthians sixteen nineteen. Um, one thing that was done, um, you know, is done in these these small groups is that you have the Lord's Supper and what was done in the first century was it, you know it wasn't just uh, you know bread and wine or cracker and wine it was really the the fellowship of a full meal the, the Lord's Supper was uh, was always part of a of a full meal where everybody you know sat down and communed and they, they shared their love they shared their experiences in Christ and uh, they they prayed and 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 they ate and and ate and they drank and the, and they were merry they were merry in the Lord right First Corinthians 11, verses 21 to 34. And these uh, gatherings, these small ecclesia, uh, were open and they were participatory. In other words, uh, everybody has uh, a gift, everybody has a role to play. And it's not about one person, you know, you know dominating everything, because you can have a, you know, you can just set up a, a home, you know, with, uh, with some kind of a, some kind of a, uh, a pulpit and rows of chairs and everything else. And before you know it, you just have a small version of the bigger thing that you were trying to get away from. If you're trying to get away from this, you know, this, this scripted and mechanical over-organized 
organization of worship, you know, in a, in a denominational religious church building, if you're trying to get away from that, just uh, replicating it in a smaller uh, version in a, in a private home, that doesn't really get away from the principle, right? So it, it really has to be something that's kind of uh, spiritually spontaneous of the Holy Spirit, uh, open for everybody to participate because everybody has um, gifts. And so whatever your gift is, you know, there are people who will be able to give a word of God. There are, there are people uh, who will be able to sing. There, will, there are people who will be able to pray. There are people who will be able to uh, uh, provide some special kind of, you know, prophecy or to exhort, to encourage, to edify, to comfort, to help. I mean, there are all these gifts and ministries that are available uh, in, in, in any group. And, and, you know, people have to be encouraged, you know, to share them and use them. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, chapters 12 through 14. You can read all about the, uh, the gifts. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And um, this uh, group of believers, of followers of Jesus Christ, really uh, is a family. And it's not just that they say they're a family, they actually treat each other the way family members should be treating each other and not the way family members often do treat each other, which is sh shabbily, quite pathetic in many cases. But, uh, you know, this, is, this, this ecclesia is supposed to be a true family. You know, and, and really, which means you are considerate of other people, you care for other people. You don't put up with, you know, uh, ungodly things. No, not at all. You, you use discernment and wisdom, and you, don't, you, you know, you don't take crap, you know, to put it bluntly. But, but you are a loving family as much as possible, and you are considerate as much as possible, and helpful as much as possible. And, and that sense of family of faith, you know, that's that's very important to God, and that's that has uh, that's kind of lost in churches. And you know, it's not sometimes it's not even it's it's not even a deliberate thing. But when you organize worship, you know, in a building, and the you know the the pastor or the priest is above in a pulpit, and everybody is organized in pews, you know, it it just it's kind of it, it turns the worship into something very passive on the part of the listeners. But when people gather together to worship, I mean, anybody could have a word to say, right? Anybody could have an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. But that that format of worship, you know, blocks that that you know, you know you can't really do that because you have to sit there quietly in the pew and of course you're in one pew and you know you can't uh, you know you you, you can't uh, talk to people in, in other pews and you know if you when you first come in you know you can't sit down in someone's pew that they've been sitting in with their family for the last 20 years so you know you can't do that so so these pews they they uh they, they kind of complicate uh, sharing and, and, and unity and, and of course the whole principle of uh, you know everything centered on the you know the pastor and the message you know if you ask someone how was that uh, um, service well uh, you know most of the commentary will be that the message was pretty good or the message stunk or you know you know whatever I mean it's uh, to make it so you know pastor centric and sermon centric it, it really isn't the the hallmark of a free-flowing uh, worship, you know, led led by the Holy Spirit. So you can read about some of this in Galatians 6, verse 10, 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Romans 12, 5, Ephesians 4, 15, Romans 12, 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 25, 26, and 2 Corinthians 8, 12 to 15. And uh, when it comes to the leadership of an ecclesia, um, uh, and I want to be careful how I approach this. There's, there are a number of elders. Now, the word elder, it means older. You know, it doesn't mean better. It doesn't mean smarter. It doesn't mean higher in God's estimation. It just means that you've, you've had more spiritual experience. You know, it may... Uh, you know, it, it may have something to do with your chronological age, or it may not. But you have you have had spiritual experience. You've been tested and passed some spiritual tests, and so you are just objectively you are an elder. And in any group, you you may have several you know elders you know who can uh, do certain things to assist and help people grow spiritually but not lord it over them it's it should be this is really a flat organization under jesus christ jesus christ is the head and everybody else is has something to offer including eldership uh you know including you know pastor and evangelist and you know maybe deacon or, or whatever it is uh, but yeah everybody has something but nobody is over anybody else and that's that's a very tough concept because in the in the devil's world everything is competition right 
But in the uh, spiritual life under the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we're all parts of the body that are supposed to fit together in unity, you know, totally opposed to what we've been indoctrinated to think, even of church business even if church matters. But so you've got different elders that can offer different things to the to the younger members, but nobody is better than anybody else. Nobody has a higher standing. Um, there's no uh, hierarchy, there's no denominations, there's no honorific titles, you know, uh, really, there's no, there, there, there's no professional clergy, there's, there's no uh, need to give, you know, and in, in fact, it's interesting about giving because Back in the first century, when basically all of the believers were uh, were Jewish, uh, the teachers, the ones who taught, they specifically and on purpose, they took on a different, uh, they took on a trade, you know, so they could earn a living. They wouldn't have to ask people for money. This idea of asking people for money, this came from the, uh, the, the this came really from the Roman Empire when when Constantine uh, Christianized the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, eventually uh, the church became a money-making proposition that didn't have to pay taxes and got subsidies from the government and buildings from the government. And this is, you know, Constantine started that in about the third century. And for the last 17 centuries, in the Church of Rome and in the different uh, Protestant churches and, you know, Eastern Catholic churches and, and even some non, non-Christian religions, you know, this, uh, this pattern of religion uh, has been pretty standard you know there have been some changes and of course in different religions they worship a different god uh but uh the the, the pattern of worship you know is pretty pretty standard since the church of rome uh, which has had a, an unbelievable influence on man's relationship to god and and i would say uh, you know made big changes in that starting in the third century and and not not for the better so that's just a, a sidelight is that uh we don't want to get too uh, carried away by, you know, hierarchy and titles and denominations. We really, you know, we'd like to avo- avoid those things, even though at the same time, you know, you, you want to benefit from the, uh, the, the, the eldership capabilities of certain members of a group, right? And the, the business of titles, you know, when we first started our ministry, I know that we, uh, you know, the two of us had discussions about, you know, well, what, what do we call m- myself? You know, I was... Uh, um, you know, I didn't go to Bible college or seminary or anything like that. Um, but I have been studying the Word of God for, you know, well over 20 years, you know, and really in a serious way, I've been studying the Word. And, um, you know, I did receive a human ordination from a, a prominent local pastor and also from uh, the uh, um, Christian National Church. So I do have the ordination as a minister of the church, but I mean, as far as, you know, what do I call myself, you know, when I do messages on YouTube? Well, I've tried to study the functions uh, as much as possible. I guess pastor is as close to close to it as anything else, but it, it is kind of a struggle. And really, I think the reason why it's a struggle is that honestly, the, the purest form of service is to say that you have no honorific title, right? Nobody needs a title. We have functions. We have abilities that God gave us. And we just naturally, in a spirit-led way, we perform these functions when we're worshiping in a group. So uh, I, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, and the final point I'll make uh, is that very often, um, you know, and nowadays you, you hear about a, a type of ministry called church planting. Well, the Apostle Paul was really kind of a church planter, and that's 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 really kind of the work of an apostle. That's an apostolic service, and uh, you know, he was a, a you know a teacher and a, pr- a pastor and a preacher and an evangelist and everything else. I mean, he did everything. But one of the things that Paul did is that he was an apostolic worker. He was a, he was a church planter. And you, uh, which means you, uh, you help people establish these small ecclesias as part of the big ecclesia, the big, the, the whole body of believers. You help the small groups get going, uh, and you go from place to place, and you don't stay for too long, uh, and you go back every once in a while to see what what's going on, and are there certain needs, and this and that. And one interesting thing that comes up from Paul's uh, participation in these uh, in these small groups and his planting of these small groups is. Uh, you know, what about supporting the pastor uh, or the, the leader, the, the, the worker, the, let's call him the, the worker or the laborer, what about supporting that person financially? And Paul, in the scripture, he does make a distinction. 
here because when he's church planting, he's saying it's very good that you support me financially, you know, because he's got to travel around from place to place, at least cover the guy's expenses, right? So he's he's making a, a distinction between that and the idea of, you know, attending one of these groups, you know, just as a member and you worship as a member and, uh, you, ha you know, you participate in the way that God has anointed you to participate, but you don't, you know, you don't ask for money. Uh, money should not be an issue in an ecclesia. Um, everybody has has a provision from God, and you know you are responsible for your own lives and your own families. And we come together and worship. If people decide that they want to put together their own money freely and voluntarily to support something, then they can do that. But this idea of a command performance, you know, and passing the bucket, this this would uh, this was not done in the first century. Although Paul is an apostolic worker, a church planter says that in that in that case, of course, you know, help help me, support me in that way so I can help you get started. But you know, once once a, a, a group, a body is up and running, a group is up and running, uh, you know, there's no offering or anything like that. And you know, the, there's no professional pastor who gets paid. Uh, or, you know, takes a cut of the offering or anything like that. It's just, it, it wasn't done. So that's, you know, if it's in Scripture and it's not contradicted anywhere else in Scripture, I mean, it's good in 2016. Why is it not good in 2016? You know, we want to uh, make all these exceptions because times have changed and we have to be modern. And, uh, you know, okay, fine, we can use modern technology to spread the Word of God. That's, uh, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm all, uh, you know, done with that. But, uh, you know, as as far as you know, looking at the at, at the scripture, I mean, uh, you know, we shouldn't twist the scripture, but we also, uh, you know, when it's when it's the, something is there and it's clear and it's not it's not contradicted anywhere else, then that's uh, that's something that we should pay attention to. That's something God wants us to pay attention to. So that's a little bit about uh, some of the traits of ecclesia that I've been reading about and studying about. That uh, these small groups are in homes, and the Lord's Supper is a full. Uh, meal and the meetings are open and participatory and everybody uses their gifts and behave as family. There's a plurality of elders. Uh, apostolic workers can help plant a group, uh, get a group going, and no denominations or honorific titles or uh, hierarchy. And the plurality of elders, I didn't give you the verses for the last few. For the plurality of elders, it's Acts 20, verses 17, 28, and 29, and 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. Um, the apostolic workers, Acts uh, chapters 13 to 21, you can have a few illustrations in those chapters uh, of, of the principle that I'm trying to uh, present. Um, the apostolic letters and such. And then um, no denominations, honorific titles, no hierarchy. Uh, you can read about those things in Acts 8 verse 1, Acts 13 verse 1, Acts 18 verse 22, Romans 16 1, 1 Thessalonians 1 1, Matthew 23 8 through 12, Matthew 20 25 through 28, and Luke 22 25 and 26. So with all of that being said, I thank you very much for listening, and I uh, hope to hear from you soon and hope to be with you again soon. Have a good week. Bye for now.